Car Buying 101 Refresher Course in today's challenging car market and an answer to how dealerships became dealerships. <laughs> Hi, I'm Kevin Hunter, the homework guy, here today with the amazing Elizabeth, the homework gal. So, you've been looking to buy a new or new to you used car, have you? If you didn't already know, a well executed car buying process commonly involves mind numbing hours of searching and researching, and yes, even for us including an abundance of painful and stressful price haggling and encounters with different dealerships that, all of which, quite frankly, leaves you feeling frustrated with all the games dealers are playing with pricing, added fees, and forced add-on products. The whole thing can be described as a nightmare. Cars are, of course, expensive, especially with the supply chain fiasco creating shortages and pricing spikes, but it's not as simple as that. Shopping for cars is not like shopping for any other products. Unlike, say, computers or refrigerators in a retail setting, cars are typically not sold for one standard price. The truth is, 10 people could go into a dealership and each pay a wildly different amount to buy the exact same vehicle, with each one hearing a very different story behind why the vehicle is priced that way. Yeah. Not a lot of which makes sense to pretty much anyone. Economists label the car dealer type of pricing strategy as price discrimination. That's where, instead of charging everyone the same price, sellers charge people different prices based on their willingness to pay or the ease to which they can be buffaloed. In simpler terms, it means that the seller milks as much money out of you as they can. While not all dealerships engage in this pricing strategy, many do it aggressively, and you should expect it anywhere you go. That's right. This is often called snake oil style salesmanship, accompanied by deceptive marketing tactics hidden fees, and overpriced add-ons like floor mats, anti-theft systems, or anti-rust undercoating. Some consumers call the dealers that employ those tactics stealerships. More on that in just a moment. It's a little bit ironic, don't you think, that dealers call window etching an anti-theft system <laughs> when the first one who gets hosed by it is the person who buys it, already proving that it doesn't stop you from becoming a victim of robbery. <laughs> oh, touche. <laughs> the tricky pricing strategy used by dealerships can be maddening for consumers and many find the haggling over the price of a new car or truck with slick, commission-seeking sales staff to be intimidating and exhausting. So who bears the brunt of this dealership pricing strategy? A number of studies find that dealerships tend to charge minorities more than white people. Another study finds that older people tend to be charged higher prices than younger people. Definitely. And that older, single women tend to be charged the highest prices of all. It's a proven fact that there's a big price tag for being a customer that's too nice and respectful. <laughs> One study found that dealerships tend to treat a buyer's decision to trade in their used car like a neon sign on their foreheads flashing, charge me more. Yeah. That's because trading in your used car while easier than selling it directly also fetches less money, often far less money. Dealerships apparently see this as an indicator that you're stupid, unsavvy, or very willing to burn your cash, so they jack up the price of the car they sell to you. And unwittingly, the type of car that you trade in often offers a wealth of information on how much they can charge you for the new one. In normal times, when supply was ample and dealerships were more worried about getting cars off the lot, it was common for them to charge less than the manufacturer's suggested retail price, MSRP. But with supply chain problems creating shortages of new vehicles, many dealerships have been charging much more than MSRP. We've all become very familiar with what is known as a market adjustment. Indeed. Meanwhile, the dealerships that don't add markups to MSRP are seeing their inventory depleted quickly and often have wait times for months or even years before these coveted vehicles. Michelle Krebs is a longtime automotive researcher who serves as the executive analyst of Cox Automotive, which owns well-known companies like Kelly Blue Book and Autotrader, she said, this is the first time in my career that I've seen most dealerships charging at list price or over, she says. And it's simply because there's high demand, low inventory, and they can do it. Krebs says that she's seen some cases where dealerships have charged buyers literally tens of thousands of dollars over MSRP, as have we. Dealerships are typically independent franchises of their affiliated automaker, which means they are autonomous businesses that can basically do what they want when it comes to setting prices. And they do exactly that, don't they? But many automakers are not happy that their franchises are charging crazy high markups. A recent study from the consumer group Growth for Knowledge suggests that excessive price gouging sours consumers on not just a particular dealership, but the brand as a whole. 
at least some automakers seem to know this earlier this year Hyundai Motor Company sent a letter to its dealerships urging them to end deceptive practices such as advertising a low price online and then charging a much higher price when customers go into the store. The company complained that sky-high markups were damaging our brand's long-term ability to capture new customers and retain loyal ones. And likewise, Ford Motor Company urged its dealers to cut down on markups and threatened to cut back on sending them Ford's most coveted vehicles if they didn't. And yet, the new Ford F-150 Lightning electric pickup truck and the Ford Bronco are some of the most marked up vehicles on the market, regularly being priced at much higher than what Ford has said they should be sold for. The problem for Ford is that dealerships are independent and the manufacturer's suggested retail price is just that, suggested. And hard-headed, greedy dealers aren't often open to suggestions, even <laughs> when those suggestions come from the manufacturer of their own cars. Newer automakers like Tesla and Rivian have been trying to build distribution and service networks that dump the use of independent dealerships. They've built a direct-to-consumer retail model in which consumers custom design their vehicles on the internet and receive them directly from the manufacturer without dealership middlemen and exhausting haggling over price with commission-seeking salespeople. They also pay a lot more for these cars. For in-person needs, these automakers provide their own facilities and service centers. However, there are state franchise laws across the country that protect independent dealerships, and these laws have made it difficult to disrupt the dealer system and offer consumers potentially a better way of buying vehicles. To be fair to dealerships, not that we need to. No. no. They do provide important services. They offer a distribution and service network, which is seemingly vital to both manufacturers and car buyers. They offer buyers the ability to check out, test drive, and learn about cars at their facilities, which really do cost a lot when it comes to real estate, inventory, and manpower. If the manufacturer recalls something, there are thousands of local dealerships across the nation there to fix the problem. They also, of course, create a lot of jobs in local communities. But while having a sprawling network of local dealerships may seem valuable, this geographic reach also gives them super-sized political power. If you wonder why dealerships seem to get away with the shabby and often unethical treatment they give people, that's the very big reason why. Spread out all over every major metro area, local dealerships are important constituents for a whole slew of federal, state, and local politicians, and they pander to them constantly. Together with the fact that they're a trillion dollar plus industry makes them a very effective lobbying force. Opponents argue that the protective franchise laws they've worked to erect and maintain thwart entrepreneurs' ability to create new, more efficient business models that would serve customers better. It is a known fact that state legislatures passed franchise laws and continue to overwhelmingly support franchise laws to separate car sales from manufacturing, prevent monopoly pricing by factories, promote competition in auto sales and service, and keep jobs and investment local. The franchise system definitely delivers on these benefits. Some claims, like the fact that local dealerships create jobs, are undeniable. Others are highly debatable. First of all, there are more than a dozen automakers in the United States, so no single car maker comes close to being a monopoly. And there's no clear data pointing to how adding a middleman to the process reduces the prices for customers. Hardly. Yeah, especially when you consider that this middleman, the car dealer, often resorts to a slew of tactics that tend to raise the price. Many of today's dealership, by the way, are not mom and pop shops. The nope. industry is seeing growing consolidation with multi-billion dollar corporations now owning hundreds of dealerships across the nation. A very bad thing for the consumer. Arrogant multi-billion dollar corporations which act like they are above the law. Earlier this summer, the FTC proposed new rules aimed at combating the sleazy skullduggery found at many dealerships. We covered those not long ago. The FTC said, as auto prices surge, the commission is seeking to eliminate the tricks and traps that make it hard or impossible to comparison shop or leave consumers saddled with thousands of dollars in unwanted junk charges. The new rules the FTC proposes include a ban on deceptive advertising in which dealerships market cars as way cheaper than they actually intend to sell them for, a ban on junk fees for fraudulent add-on products and services that provide no benefit to the consumer, and a requirement that dealerships disclose upfront all costs and conditions for buying their vehicles. Well, not surprisingly, the fat dogs over at NADA opposed these proposed rules, but with the help of our viewers, the FTC slammed the door in their faces. And good on them for yeah. doing that. When the FTC rules go live, we will launch a THG Car Buyer's Guide, which will be designed to help you hold the dealer's feet to the fire because 
These rules will not be enough to stop some dealers from doing this stuff anyway. You, the car buyer, will have to be aware and then call them out when they step out of line. So, how do you buy a car in today's current market and dealer conditions? Great question. For years, we've always advised you to do your homework, talk to your own bank or credit union first, and then practice patience and persistence. That's still true. Yeah. You have to be willing to walk. You might need to keep looking even after you think you got close to making a deal. And you may need to be a little flexible on your choices. That also is still true. It's possible that the brand or car style that you want isn't available at a price you're willing to pay. And equally important, expand your geographic search. Many people don't want to shop more than 25 miles away from home, but it's quite possible, yeah. especially given today's car dealer environment, that you may need to go much further than that. On a closing note, a brief word on our sponsored product, MPG Extreme. If you're a current user of premium grade fuel in the hope of getting better fuel economy, make sure you see Scotty Kilmer's video titled, Seven Fuel Myths Stupid People Fall For. Sorry for his insulting title. And then, here's a short video clip Kevin shot for you at the fuel pumps today. All right, so here's the 87 to 91 octane. A lot of people say, instead of using X cap, why not just buy premium fuel? Well, 389 is what the 87 is, and 449 is what the 91 is. Now, if you look at the difference, we've got a 26, uh, we've got a 27 gallon tank. Generally, I always have a 26 gallon top off when I tank it up, and so 26 gallons by 389 is 101 bucks. 449 times 26 gallons is 116.74. So, a pretty big difference in cost. According to Scotty Kilmer, higher octane fuel is a waste of money. It does not have greater energy content. It does not burn hotter, faster, cleaner, or more fully. But it definitely costs you more, as I showed you right at the gas station. 87 octane fuel at 389 and 26 gallons is $101.14. 91 octane fuel at 449 is $116.74. A difference of $15.60. And all I get is the bragging rights that I'm burning premium when I buy it. Meanwhile, the X cap gives me 22% boost in fuel economy using just one and a half tablets of the X cap by MPG Extreme for just $3 worth of product when purchased in the ISR pack, a significantly cheaper option than buying premium fuel, and it delivers a proven positive result. The X cap lowers emissions, boosts octane, improves power and performance, and I don't have to spend an extra $15 per tank for gas to get those benefits. The good news is neither do you. Order your X-Caps today and start benefiting from fuel savings, not just in miles per gallon, but also by avoiding the extra costs of premium fuel. Thanks everyone for coming back and a special thanks to the hundreds of you who have jumped at the opportunity to try MPG Extreme. Saving money on gas or diesel and supporting our THG channel. It's a perfect win-win. I'm Kevin Hunter, the homework guy, signing off with amazing Elizabeth, the homework gal. We, we gotta, gotta go. go.